Well, welcome everyone. For those that are new to BRAG, um, the Berkeley Research Administrators Group, um, our mission is to provide a forum for collegial interaction in the research administration community. And we, we do this by facilitating presentations by subject matter experts, creating an environment to foster peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and seeking and sharing best practices. Today is part of our um, is a part of Bragg's research series in which we invite faculty to present their research. This is a great opportunity to connect our administrative work to the technical work being completed by the faculty and labs that we support. I'm going to turn it over now to Daniel to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thanks, Professor Keltner, um, for coming to do this. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction and then let you take it away. Um, Dacher Keltner is a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center. Dacher's research focuses on the biological and cultural evolution of compassion, all love, beauty, and humility, as well as power, social class, and inequality. Dacher is the author of many scientific articles and several books, including Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life, The Power Paradox, how we gain and love, influence, and awe, the new science of everyday wonder and how it can transform your life. Yakar has won many research teaching, mentoring, and servicing awards, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has a consultant, he, he has consulted for Apple, Pinterest, Google, the Sierra Club, and was a scientific consultant for Pixar's Inside Out and Soul and for the Center for Constitutional Rights and its work to outlaw solitary confinement. So thanks again, Professor Keltner, for taking your uh, valuable time to come speak with us. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you, all of you. Uh, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to give this talk because I know how much trouble I create amongst you guys at administering and getting grants in. And, uh, and uh, you guys are um, a vital organ of, of UC Berkeley in, in making sure that our, our, um, our gifts and grants uh, get to the university in the right way. So thank you for all of your work. I know it's thankless and ceaseless, and, uh, but uh, we are appreciative and very grateful. So I am, what I'm going to do um, <clears throat> is um, talk about uh, AWE, this new book I have, and science that's been supported by all kinds of grants that you guys have administered and Daniel has helped with all kinds of imaginative gifts that support this work. Um, I'll talk for 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have 10 minutes of Q and A and see what you guys are thinking about. Um, so looking forward to hearing your thoughts. I learn so much from the people I talk to. So, um, all right, let's get this up. I'm screen sharing and I wish we were all in person, but this will suffice. So. Um, so I'd like to talk about um, the science of awe, because I, uh, as Daniel said, I'm in the psychology department. I'm a laboratory science scientist. I do experiments and measure physiology. Uh, but I think that the, the deep topic of awe really required more than just lab science. And so I'll tell you a few different stories about awe to uh, help us understand the forms of this incredible emotion and why we have it. Um, in the first place. And I think it's a vital emotion for uh, all the various struggles that we're facing today from climate crises to authoritarianism, racism, and the like. I think awe is an important player in, in uh, moving forward in this world. So scientists begin with definitions, and this one is hard to define. Uh, various people from Immanuel Kant to spiritual writings to Edmund Burke to Ralph Waldo Emerson to Rachel Carson have tried to define awe. I approach it <clears throat> as an emotion scientist. So awe is a feeling that you have when you are in present, present, in the presence of something really vast, most typically, and that transcends your understanding of the world, right? It is fundamentally an emotion about things we don't understand, which is interesting. Uh, colloquially, we can say at awe is the feeling we have when we encounter vast mysteries. Um, I don't want to bore you with um, kind of the basic science that we've done in the lab uh, that you may have heard about, amazing, what's called computational science. 
uh, by Alan Cowan, just a standout Berkeley PhD student. Now he went, uh, turned down academic offers, went to Google and now has his own startup. But this is just computational work where you take a lot of different stimuli, you have people rate their feelings in response to thousands of gifts and 1500 pieces of music in China and the United States, how people speak with prosody, the tone of their voice, uh, and also how they express emotion in the face and voice. And this work <clears throat> is the kind of scientific work that we do. What these plots are, each color represents a distinct emotion uh, in this space, for example, of music or looking at gifts or how we use our voice in prosody uh, or in ancient Colombian artifacts. And what this tells us, very importantly, is is awe is, is a distinct state. It's a basic emotion, right? You can see that even with prosody, this purple here is how we communicate awe with prosody. Uh, you can find awe in certain parts of the emotion, the musical space of awe-inspiring music. The face and the voice have a distinct display and vocal, vocal register of awe around the world. Whoa! Um, and then this is a well-known study that we did, uh, largely Alan, where people responded to lots of different GIFs, short videos. And, and over here, what you find is that awe-inspiring GIFs, where we feel awe, are really different from beauty, absorption, when we admire people like MLK. So this just tells us awe is, is a real state that we want to go understand in its scientific uh, place. Uh, this map as well, this will be the last weird map I show you. Uh, I'd really encourage you guys, this is a, a project we did with Google Arts and Culture. We had people rate 1500 paintings from around the world. Uh, and then we do sp statistical analyses to reveal um, what, what are the different emotions we feel in response to the largest study of visual art ever done. And again, awe is, is, um, is right there. It's this distinct state different from when you're absorbed or feeling dreamy or mysterious. Uh, it has its coherence. So the raw science, basic science tells us, here's a state that had been ignored by science that we should go understand. So given that, and given the deep history in studying awe from, a, you know, from really since people have been writing about <clears throat> human experience for the past 3000 years, um, we need to differentiate awe from related states. So wonder, often used interchangeably with awe, is a mental state of curiosity that follows awe, right? You have this, uh, you suddenly have this, you know, experience of an earthquake, sorry to scare you, you know, it's kind of awe-inspiring, and then you go home and think like, God, you know, how do buildings survive earthquakes? And you're curious about what earthquakes are. There's a lot of writing that I'll talk briefly about, about how awe really is a, a companion of religious feeling, as Ralph Waldo Emerson and William James and many others have argued, uh, our encounters with the, the divine or our sense of the sacred. Uh, there's a very closely related state called bliss, uh, which is where you just dissolve when you feel love for what's, this, what's sublime. And it really is different from awe. And then finally, and importantly, we've done a lot of work that really sets awe apart. And this is important for you guys. You know, if you look at our experiences of emotions, awe down here in the green is really quite different from fear, horror, and anxiety. So awe really, although the etymology of the word awe makes it sound like it's tied up with horror, our actual experience today in the 21st century suggests it's really distinct. Okay, so I wanna tell you um, a few different stories of awe. Uh, and, um, and as we try to understand this mysterious emotion. The first is an evolutionary story of awe. And, and the thinking, you know, we have incredible scholars here at Berkeley studying birdsong and, you know, uh, stress and rats and uh, Daniela Kaufer and, and, you know, non-human primates and the like. And we, we turn to those species to start to understand in the, the great story of of mammalian and then primate evolution, are there similar structures of experience and behavior that you can observe in social 
mammals like humans. And indeed, remarkably, social mammals tend to fluff up their fur, as you can see here, a piloerection response that humans feel with awe. Those are little hair muscles around hair follicles. They contract, your hair stands up, and our social mammal relatives fluff up their fur when they're joining with others in the face of adversity, when cold strikes or predators are nearby or their adversaries, rats and primates will fluff up their fur, lean into each other, get stronger together to face what is complex, uncertain, and perilous. Uh, much like awe, right? Awe is about merging with others, facing uncertainty. And, and, and here we see the physiological structure to awe observed in uh, our social mammal relatives. Uh, on this thinking, Jane Goodall, uh, one of my heroes said, you know, she was watching this chimp show this amazing waterfall display. Her chimpanzees that she observed will show all like behavior of fluffing up the fur, reflecting, being quiet, getting small, um, sort of ritualistically moving when they encounter vast things in nature. And she said, I can't help feeling that this waterfall display or dance is perhaps triggered by feelings of wonder and awe we feel. Why wouldn't they also have some kind of feelings of spirituality, which is really being amazed at things outside yourself? Mammals, social mammals, start to transcend themselves and become amazed at things outside. And awe is right at the heart of that dynamic. Awe, as you well know, has an incredible cultural history, incredible. And in fact, <clears throat> you know, after writing this book, I was, it's hard to think of any significant facet of culture from music to art to religion to politics to legends to fiction to film that isn't involved with awe. Um, Dr. Yuria Salidman, who's a fellow at the Othering and Belonging Institute, has written about how in Mesoamerica, in, in, in indigenous cultures, 500 million indigenous peoples around the world, uh, they live near the world's great sources of biodiversity. They have this sense of awe in their belonging to nature, what she calls ecological belonging. Their experiences of the natural world, of following seasons and migrations and patterns, make them awestruck at their, that they're part of an ecosystem. Rebecca Stone has written about how awe is really part of the design <clears throat> visually in, in Mesoamerican art, like this Wishkara painting. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, in the great spiritual traditions, um, awe is, is a fundamental element of mystical conversion, right? This is Paul on the road to Damascus, encountering the divine, mind blown by that encounter. We go to Hinduism, and the Bhagavad Gita is just a series of stories <clears throat> of revelations about seeing the world through God's eyes. Uh, a lot of the great writings in Christianity, Julian of Norwich, St. Francis of Assisi, are attempts to put to words the, just the feeling of spirituality, the feeling of connecting to things that are beyond ourselves, that are somehow supernatural and divine. And then finally, really importantly, as <clears throat> we move forward in history, and in many ways, UC Berkeley is the, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> version of this, which is in the age of enlightenment, in the 18th century, and then the age or era of romanticism that follows 50 years later, in around 1800, um, all becomes secularized. It becomes this everyday psychological experience. Edmund Burke, an amazing kind of revolutionary book from 1757 says, yeah, you used to think that awe was a religious emotion, but once we really observe ourselves, we find that awe is found in secular psychological experiences. Experiences with shadows and clouds and loud sounds and big animals and architectural features like repetition. Um, radically important book. 
50 years later, you have people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Goethe, the great sci uh, poet and scientist, and von Humboldt, one of the most influential scientists who kind of discovered the idea in the Western world of the ecosystem, really urging us like, ah, oh, is the fount of creativity, of discovery, of knowledge. Einstein would follow this and say, awe oh, is the engine of art and science. Um, and we find it in nature and music. And, and they would influence Ralph Waldo Emerson. Awe oh, becomes an everyday psychological experience. Thank goodness for a psychologist like me. Um, and so now let me tell you a scientific story of awe. And I'll highlight a few of the discoveries of the 20 years of science we've been engaged in. Um, a lot of it at Berkeley, and in many ways, it tells a Berkeley story. Um, so just to you know, summarize, just so we can get oriented to some of the specific domains, um, the word, you know, if I asked you, like, what is awe? You know, how, tell me about an experience of awe. What, what do you, what's its core meaning? Um, you might be biased by the connotations of the word awe. The word awe emerges from uh, 8th century Middle English, Ege, and 9th century Old Norse, Agi. And those concepts or words really referred to terror and dread. Uh, but today, as I note down here, about around the world, about three quarters of awe experiences are really positive. They feel good, as we saw in some of those maps I showed you. Uh, that's because history has changed dramatically. Uh, you know, awe <laughs> in the 8th and 9th century, people were living to 40 years of age. There was tremendous violence. Babies, a quarter of babies died before the age of two. There were plagues and diseases and torture were commonplace. The world was horrifying. And as Steve Pinker at Harvard has argued, we've seen this decline of historical violence, historical decline. And I think what that did, as it said, it allowed us to feel these wonders uh, that aren't filled with dread. Here's another big discovery. Um, awe is everywhere. And, and this, this is why we do science. You know, I think if I asked you just intuitively, how often have you felt awe? You'd probably say, oh, I don't know, two or three times in my life. Um, we surveyed people, 10 different countries. We asked them every night, tell us if you felt like you had a feeling of awe, like you encountered a vast mystery that you don't understand. And once people reflected about this and put away their stereotypes, they were like, yeah, you know, in fact, our data revealed people feel two to three experiences of awe a week. It's everywhere. And then this just, and we're going to see specific evidence of this. Um, you know, I, I teach happiness here at Berkeley. Uh, we promote it at the Greater Good Science Center. People are really interested in like, you know, right now with post-pandemic, depression's up, you know, anxiety's up, life expectancy in the U.S. dropped for two years. A lot of worrisome signs. How do we get healthy and happy? And what, you know, after this science, I feel, you know, confident in saying, go find some awe, you know. Uh, what you see is little moments of awe, which we'll unpack make you feel less self-focused, more humble. It elevates the vagus nerve in your body. It reduces the, the immune system's levels of inflammation, which is a pathway to disease. It reduces stress, makes you feel like you have more time, makes your thought more rigorous and open. Awe is good for you. Um, and a good reason why we've started to think about interventions that promote it. So, um, I'll, I'll skip this. This is just a, a recent paper, very proud, Maria, Maria Monroy, first generation, Berkeley undergrad, got her PhD at Berkeley, um, now interviewing for top academic jobs as a professor, uh, a Berkeley story. We have a nice paper if you want to get into the details of all the ways in which awe is good for us, and I'll, I'll show you some of those as well. This is what scientists do. They, we try to break phenomena down into these processes. Uh, and this is how we approach all. Okay, so let's get specific with a few realms of awe, grounded in kind of these basic discoveries of awe science. So um, I was in my Berkeley lab one day, and, you know, we were, uh, you know, and we always have a, you know, my lab usually has 
you know, a dozen or so undergrads, honor students you may have, you know, seen or heard about. And like Hari Srinivasan, who studied awe in autistics, amazing. Um, you know, we have postdocs and visiting scholars, all the people you help come here. And we we're sitting there and we were at a state in the science where it's like, you know, we can, we can measure awe. You know, I can study its vocalization. I can look at its brain pattern. I can look at goosebumps. I can look at how it makes you feel small and humble and part of something larger. But we, we, we felt inherently frustrated with that science that it didn't get to the magic of awe, like the, you know, when you read about a spiritual conversion or somebody at a political march and they're just blown away or the Swifties now going to Taylor Swift and they come back from a Taylor Swift concert as people have been reporting to me when I give talks like Taylor Swift is goddess, you know, whatever. Um, we just didn't feel like we had captured it. And so <clears throat> at the time I was reading uh, William James, who's this phenomenal American scholar, uh, shaper of, um, you know, American psychology. And he felt this, he was really interested in the essence of religion. And he just, he felt that the only way you could really get to it was through stories, through just people's narrative accounts of, in his case, a mystical experience. And, and we did the same in the realm of awe. What, you know, Yang Bai and Maria Monroy and I, two Berkeley PhD students, as we <clears throat> went out, gathered stories of awe from, and if you're really interested in, you know, a good team meeting exercise, just have everybody share a story of awe. When's the last time, or tell us about a time when you felt wonder and struck by the mystery and vastness of something. And what um, people talked about was the power of moral beauty in other people other people's kindness and courage and overcoming. How powerful nature is, right? Back to Dr. Yuri Salidwin, when I'm in nature, or you are in nature, Berkeley campus, the redwood trees, the sunset, clouds, we feel awe. <clears throat> Sharing in collective movement, visual art, music. This is fascinating, big ideas. If I asked all of you, like, you know, What's a big idea that gives you awe? Some of you would be like, man, you know, the universe is expanding or black holes or, you know, free markets or, you know, Berkeley undergrads, capitalism, you know, or Marxism. Um, big idea, dark matter. I had a guy freak out in a talk I was giving. He was like, man, we're all dark matter. We're nothing. We're just, there's, there's nothing to us, you know. I was like, you know, if I tweak your nose really hard with a pair of pliers, you, your dark matter, you know, you will definitely show that you were made of something physical. And then religious, mystical stuff, and fascinating life and death. The life cycle um, can bring us off. So <coughs> with these eight wonders, let me take you on <clears throat> a journey of what we've learned about awe. The first most universal source of awe is uh, moral beauty or elevation when we are overwhelmed by other people's kindness that they overcome obstacles uh, you know UC Berkeley undergrad Hari Srinivasan was a non-speaking autistic student made his way to Berkeley was one of our um, uh, university medalists last year you really should look him up um, communicates through computer mediated communication and you know when you're around him and you see his poetry and his journalism now he's a PhD in neuroscience you're, you're filled with goosebumps and tears and and a sense of hope um, and we reliably feel awe at response to other people's kindness courage and overcoming Ella Baker in the civil rights movement you know transcendent historical moment. Jane Addams creating a house for the poor in Chicago, one of the first. Mahatma Gandhi through nonviolence overthrowing colonial rule, right? I mean, mind-blowing acts of courage and strength and kindness that transform the world. 
It's wired into us to feel moved by other people's moral beauty. Um, <clears throat> here are a couple of examples from the stories we gathered. This is uh, from, I think, Australia. A mom says, you know, I was watching my daughter who was born with bilateral club foot, da foot dance in a ballet recital for the first time. I was filled with awe. I was in the audience with my mother and my little girl was dancing on stage. I was backstage with her before getting ready for the performance. And while watching, I felt the beginning of tears in my awes and my eyes and my heart felt like they were gonna burst with pride. I had flashbacks <clears throat> of the time when she was born with her feet upside down. It's one of my favorite stories, a son from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1973 at my cousin's restaurant. My father worked there as a bartender and I was there and my best friend from high school walked in. He is black and I am white and I hadn't seen him in five years and I embraced him and we began to talk. A guy at the bar said to my father, <clears throat> how can you allow your son to have an N-word as his friend? My father looked at this guy, loudly told him to get out of his bar and never come back. I've never been more proud of my father, who was 59 at the time. We were moved by the courage and strength and speaking truth to power of people around us. Um, one of the easiest ways to find off is just to think of morally inspiring people, read about them, contemplate a mentor, somebody who's moved you like this. When you do that, it brings you the chills, tears, uh, a special kind of tear activated by regions of the, the body that are where you unite with other people. It leads to elevated vagal tone, activation of the vagus nerve, oxytocin release, and activation in a part of the brain where we make ethical decisions. And then psychologically, these stories of moral beauty, we wanna emulate them, right? We wanna do that, we wanna get involved, we share more, we cooperate more. You know, 40% of American kids today can't name a role model. It's almost stunning to think about, someone who gives them a sense of moral beauty. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons why that's the case. We need to return to the, just the ordinary, those remarkable beauty of other people, ordinary people's morality. The second wonder that you can benefit from at Berkeley is nature. Dr. Yuria Salidwin on campus is writing, as I said, about how in indigenous traditions, just being and observing nature, feeling it, letting the, the wisdom of our evolution arise in your mind leads to profound insights about reality that all things are connected we are part of an ecosystem uh, animals and plants are animated by a vital force right you may go walking out in the woods and just feel like god everything is alive here right and unlike much of the western world as we're learning from the study of climate crises uh, you find a reverence for uh, to protect the natural world um, here are a couple of, I'll just read you this one quote <clears throat> of hundreds that we got on natural law from around the world. I love this one uh, <coughs> from Russia. This guy is out collecting mushrooms. Five years ago, collecting mushrooms in the forest. I bumped into, surprise and novelty, an uncommon hole in the ground. Around it, all, all the trees stood in a circle as if gazing into the hole, right? He's having this sort of experience that, wow, all of nature has consciousness. They have uh, an awareness. They look at things just like humans do. Uh, that's being tested now in Italy. Do plants have consciousness? Um, this is a famous story of natural awe from American history. Ralph Waldo Emerson <clears throat> was uh, walking out on a cold day uh, and he was in a near a forest in Massachusetts, and he had an awe experience. And he said, in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity that nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become... <clears throat> 
the transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all. The currents of a universal being circulate through me. For those of you who love nature writing, Emerson's essay, Nature is Fundamental. Our, our deepest insights come from observing nature. Ideas like impermanence, design. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is true in many nature-based philosophies like Taoism. Lao Tzu, this is a, a wonderful quote. Highest good is like water because water excels in benefiting the myriad creatures without contending with them and settles where none would like to be. It comes closest to the Tao or the way or the path in life. I suspect many of you have felt like you really find your ethical moral compass in being in nature and through the emotions that that experience brings. Um, we did our own Emerson test uh, of the power of, of nature. This was Paul Piff, an amazing Berkeley undergraduate student, now a professor at UC Irvine. He took undergrads to our eucalyptus grove. I hope you guys go there regularly. And they stood up and looked at the trees for one minute or they looked at a science building nearby for one minute, not quite so awe-inspiring. And what you find is a minute in the trees, our Berkeley undergrads were less self-important. You see in the green, they felt less entitled, right? We worry about entitlement in young people. They need less money to do this study. They're like, we paid them, you know? Like, I don't believe in money anymore, man. Capitalism's over. Um, and then they actually, we staged this accident and this guy walked by and dropped a bunch of pens. And our people feeling inspired by awe, uh, picked up more pens. You become more charitable and kind and helpful. Uh, with Christoph Green, an amazing Berkeley undergrad at the Greater Good Science Center, we wrote this essay. And you know, all I'll say, as you probably know, there is nothing better for your body and your mind than just a little bit of nature every day. You know, just walking in the woods, no matter where you are, just being near trees, a lot of physiological benefits that I list here. Big data analyses, if I live near green spaces uh, and feel the kind of the effects of the parks and so forth, reduce depression and anxiety, get outdoors. A um, Couple more wonders and then I'll sort of wrap it up. A third wonder of life is is remarkable and you know and i i love uh the just the richness of this is collective effervescence and that's a phrase used by uh, emile durkheim this great french sociologist and he really felt that this feeling is the core to religion which is when you're moving with other people and then you start to synchronize and then you start to realize that you are all thinking about the same thing and then you have this sense of shared consciousness and it brings this feeling of awe and ecstasy and bliss and uh sort of electricity to collective life right and in our narratives and probably you will intuit this in your own experience we find collective effervescence routinely in dance you know you go out and dance you're at a wedding you dance with everybody and it's just transcendent we find it in political moments like the free speech movement. I mean, that is awe-inspiring that a philosophy graduate student, Mario Savio, would stand up in Sproul Plaza, give a speech, lead to the occupation of the building that then spread across the country to promote free speech, which would give rise in many ways to the anti-war protests of the late 60s. That was achieved through the power of collective effervescence. 8,000 people just congregated in Sproul Plaza just because of their shared movement. Remarkable. We do this in public spaces. There are studies that show, you know, when we move through cities and it gets really crowded, we all start to synchronize our movements and we're almost like a, a river of pedestrians uh, giving us the sense of how powerful cities are. And then I love this, uh, you know, because academics often aren't that athletic and we don't believe sports is a serious thing to study. Uh, but in our research, Around the world, people feel awe at sports. You know, uh, some of you out there might have felt a little awe when Cal beat Stanford at the at the last big game. 
most of you probably feel awe when the Golden State Warriors were kind of in their peak era. And you just like, we all watch Steph Curry shoot the ball and it's like, he's a god. And you know, you're sort of transported uh, by that collective experience. And one of the great delights of this book is I got to interview Steve Kerr, who's a, a acquaintance and friend. Uh, and he said, it was a re remarkable. I was like, yeah, I went up to him and I'm like, Steve, the statistics are in, you guys are like scoring more points in short periods of time than ever in basketball history. How is, how do you do it? And there are all these hypotheses and algorithms. And there was even this um, uh, thesis that he had these special plays that he had learned, you know, by following Iowa State basketball. And he laughed at me. He said, Dacker, you know, um, I know my team's playing well when the fans in the stands get up and start dancing. And I was like, you know, what a, what a way to know uh, the transcendent qualities of sports. So just to show you how we tested this collective effervescence, this is a study I'm very proud of from Berkeley, um, a Berkeley undergrad, Maria Monroy, and then uh, Craig Anderson, a graduate student, both Craig's now faculty. Um, we, uh, in partnership with the Sierra Club, a barrier organization, took um, really poor high schoolers and veterans on a river rafting trip uh, down the American River. And at the start of the day, and then one week later, we measured how they were doing. And the hypothesis was, was that <clears throat> just by merging together and sharing awe experiences, these two groups who are vulnerable to trauma and stress and, and, and anxiety would be doing better because of the shared awe experience of rafting. So the first thing that's fascinating is this was our lab and we filmed the students with GoPro cameras. Uh, and what we found is that our students and veterans who shared rafts, their vocalization started, started to become more similar. They were merging into kind of a shared voice and their physiology became similar over the course of their day. Their stress hormone, cortisol. Sharing awe makes us resemble one another, breaks down the barriers between the self and other. Just as importantly, what we found is just a half day of awe for our teenagers, a radical drop in stress. And then for our veterans, a 32% drop in PTSD, which is when you have flashbacks and sleep disruption and you're on edge and vigilant and always worried about things um, brought about by combat in this case, our veterans had a 32% drop in PTSD, which, you know, when you work with veterans communities to find that is almost unprecedented. We also found that it was awe that was the magic ingredient of these experiences through statistical techniques. And I just wanna quote this um, veteran writing about this experience. We had them write little awe stories during the day. And he said, looking up at the star spattered sky, I thought about the universe vastness and how infinite it is mystery. It makes what I do feel less important, modesty and humility, small self, but the opportunity of what I could do more powerful and lightweight. I've never seen how many stars are in the sky like I did tonight. So awe has this healing quality, as Emerson suggested. Um, so I'll take about five more minutes of your time and, and uh, talk to you about a couple of things um, that really deserve full conversations. You know, music um, as the, you know, the Jean-Jacques Rousseau's and the Von Humboldt's and the Goethe's and the Susan Langer's and others from philosophy have said is one of the most profound sources of awe. And if you just reflect for a moment, it's so fascinating when I ask people, you know, thousands of people I've spoken to about awe, like, tell me about a, mo a moment when awe, when music gave you the chills and tears. And you think for a minute and then suddenly it's like, oh my God, you know, I remember, I remember being in Los Angeles, uh, 67 or eight, my mom's getting her PhD at UCLA and the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album came out. And we all listened to it like 
almost everybody in the United States did. And it was just like, I was seven. I was like transported, you know. It astounds me that music, which is sound waves, can come into your eardrum, these vibrations that transmit into neural signals that get into your brain. And then the next thing you know, you feel like you know the truth of life. I mean, that is astonishing to think about the power of music. So there's a lot of new science that I review um, and we're starting to do some in partnership with Carnegie Hall um, on the power of music to change our lives through awe. Um, music is old. The archaeological records suggest that, you know, 80,000 years ago, humans were making flutes and early drums. It's deeply universal in ways. Uh, Sam Mayer at Harvard has found the little songs we sing to our children have a universal sound to them, a structure that bonds child and caregiver. And the current thinking is you, music transports us through a couple of things. One is it synchronizes our, our bodies and our actions. When we start listening to music, our brains start firing at the same pattern. Our heart rate starts firing at the same pattern. We start moving to the rhythm of the music. Even six month old babies do that. And what happens is we go from being a solitary self to a collective self, right? And then <clears throat> there's also really important work that we're following up on that we learn who our culture is and our identity is from music. It contains the sounds and the me meaning of who I want to be, right? Um, there's remarkable evidence for this. Infants will approach strangers who sing familiar folk songs, right? If I'm an infant and I hear this strange adult singing a song that I've heard in my culture, I feel like they're part of my tribe. Um, amazing work on how music tells us. It, it reveals to us, it, it connects us to others around cultural identity. I bet a lot of you may have cultural traditions grounded in music, whether the Indian ragas or uh, you know, Mexican music, etc. cetera. Um, what a rich, powerful form of awe in music. Um, so I can, if you have questions, I'm happy to talk to you about religion. And then I just want to close <clears throat> by talking about awe and visual design. You know, the Berkeley campus is an awe-inspiring uh, place visually um, in many ways. Um, and, and this has been fascinating to take these principles of awe and talk to tech companies and designers and architects. There's a lot of interest right now in how do we design for awe, given its many benefits. And, um, you know, I'll just leave you with a few ideas. Um, one of the, the design features of, that, of vis the visual world that brings awe to us builds upon a more basic source of all, which is life and death cycles, that life cycles um, bring us all. And a central principle in Japanese design is what's called wabi-sabi. And it's very simply, anything that you design, a, a, a wooden uh, building, a door, um, you know, a set of uh, plates, in this particular case, the tombstones in a Kyoto cemetery that I went to are organized around the principle of wabi-sabi, which is that you want objects to reflect this very deep awe principle of the cycle of life, that everything is born, grows, plateaus, decays, and dies, and starts over. And a lot of their structures, you know, the temples, for example, they build things and they allow them to decay following this principle of wabi-sabi. We find awe in the visual world when elements signal being part of a whole. So Rembrandt was famous in his paintings for his use of light. And you start to fixate on the, the light on his collar, this bright element here. And you suddenly realize that all of the painting has the power of light that he managed to capture like very few people that illuminates 
his character and the background and gives it the sense of revelation. We feel awe visually when things hint at vastness, at grand, at grand size that's beyond our frame of reference, right? Um, the Campanile Tower, when you stand really close to it, projects upward and it seems vast. Um, so, you know, this is the Sagrada Familia Cathedral of Gaudi, famous cathedral in, in Barcelona. And a lot of his techniques, like the ceiling, just project the imagination outward. And you're like, There's, this is just part of something way beyond my understanding. I feel awe. And we can design for that. So um, the final story that I tell, um, and I'll close here, is um, the, uh, I wrote this book when, after my younger brother passed away, Rolf, um, and he uh, was a Berkeley grad um, and one year younger than me, got colon cancer, uh, horrible disease, and, and through strength of character brought us all together and he passed away in this very sublime moment uh, where I really felt like I could sense his soul. Afterwards, I was really struggling and I went in search of awe. Um, I was anxious and panicky and barely could sleep, didn't, couldn't make sense of things. And I was doing the science of awe and I'm like, God, I'm grieving the loss of my brother Rolf. And I want to go find all because I know it's good for me. And I just paused things. I put away my devices. I allowed myself moments of being open to the world. And I followed those eight wonders that I told you about, you know, of moral beauty and nature and music. And I danced and went to sporting events and, and talked to religious leaders and thought about big ideas and, and uh, went to museums and immerse myself in visual design, and it changed my life, um, as awe can. Um, why is that? Because, you know, awe, it, it brings you greater well-being, it's good for your heart and your immune system, uh, and basic biometrics of health. In our era, where 40% of Americans feel lonely all the time, awe brings you a sense of community. And then it really shines a light on what, what your point of life is, right? What are the big narratives? you were to be part of. And I learned I'm part of Berkeley. I'm part of, uh, you know, caring for veterans and, and prison. I'm part of a scientific tradition. Awe brings us back to what matters. What a great emotion. Um, that's the book. That's my website. Uh, again, you know, um, it's, I, I'm almost blushing when I think about speaking to you because uh, you guys make our, our work happen. Uh, and I am deeply grateful for the work uh, that Daniel and you and others, familiar names I see, Gnome Pines. So thank you. Um, have a good holidays, and uh, we have seven or eight minutes for some questions. Well, since, since you named me, hi, Dagger. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I might have frozen there for a second. Um, I did have a couple of questions, um, and I can tell you, I'm sure Dan, I'm, I speak for Daniel as well, when the Warriors references were particularly fun to hear because Daniel and I are such big Warriors fans. Um, but I'm, I'm here about, you know, you talk about it's kind of three core positive versus negative connotation. And, you know, just like stuff that we're familiar with in the common vernacular, like, in military strategy, shock and awe for the Iraq war. Um, you know, it's obviously a term that can be used in both directions. And I'm wondering if if it's gone different directions, if that's associated with historical factors. And then one other thing, which I know is a bigger topic, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I am curious about the relationship with religion. Yeah. Uh, and there's an obvious parallel there where yeah. you, know, you talk about nature and the awe people experience, and that's a quick thing that people who have a belief in God point to. Just yep. wondering what kind of studies or analysis has been done there. Yeah, big questions. You know, um, I mean, awe. You know, awe is a word. It refer refers to what's in your mind and in your body and in the context, which is all part of history. And its meaning is changing. You know, all the time uh, and across different cultures, as we've documented. So, for example, you know, many of us 
like an obvious source of awe was, is nature. Uh, although people of color often feel differently because it was a dangerous place in their history. Um, and today, young people, when they think about nature, they also think about the Amazon being destroyed and the oceans filled with plastics. And so they feel a lot of dread, right? So awe is always changing in its, its connotations. Uh, and that's you know why we study emotions from multiple angles, stories, physiology, uh, and the like. And so uh, you know historians are really the ones to write that book, and I bet one will be written. Um, and then you know religion, you know it's it's fascinating. The one of the big surprises the book's been out for a year is just how much it resonated with people who are religious. I'm not religious. Eighty one percent of Americans believe in the divine. Um, I don't even think I do believe I couldn't say that explicitly, but uh, Emerson, James, and others really felt the transcendent emotions were at the core of religion. It's what they cultivate, religious cultivate through rituals and touch, you know, uh, gesticulations and prayers and chanting and music and beauty. Um, and I think it's, you know, one of the interesting uh, sort of relevances of awe right now is young people are de-churching. They are leaving religions in historic records. I mean, it's astonishing. Um, but they hunger for awe. And so now you're seeing sprout up these movements of religion for atheists, secular religions, if you can, you know. And I, and I think it's an interesting cultural moment where awe will lead to the creation of new social forms. So it's right at the heart of it. Thanks. Huge questions. <laughs> um, I had a question. Sure. Dan. Um, you mentioned uh, you and your colleague doing work with indigenous groups. And I'm just curious. Um, so for people who are live their whole life in nature, yeah, with the stars every night, yeah, it's the normal thing. Yeah. How does that all oh, man. be different from someone like myself who goes camping every 10 years? And looks up at the sky and really has this yeah. wow you know i see this every 10 years yeah you know I, I and i would really and she's on campus and you could bring her in it'd be really she's going to do her field research in guatemala and chiapas soon but you know <clears throat> she writes about ecological belonging which is where you are nature you are that's it we are a live living form we're species, we're interacting with other species. And, you know, the Western mind for a couple thousand years really started to separate from nature, commodify it, own it. I study it. Oh, there it is. I study it. I'm separate from it. And in the indigenous perspective, and I'm, I don't think I could even, you know, as your question hints at, Daniel, it, it is that we are nature, you know, I am a predator an ecosystem or what have you um and i'm always separating myself from it. oh i had this experience out in nature uh and th for them it's just radically different and and i hope you know i i hope that a lot of you know in this moment of climate crisis that we return to her wisdom this indigenous wisdom and then think about how do we return to it for kids and 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 we who grew up with a different view because it's good for us so it's a I'd read Dr. Salidwin too. Dr. Keltner, we only have two minutes left, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm in awe of your science. Um, you. um, I will let Brenda wrap up, but um, if this is possible to answer this question quickly, um, I, I followed your research and I know that you talked about um, feeling of gratitude. Yeah. It'd be very beneficial for happiness. How yeah. is there a connection to all or does all include gratitude or is it too big? No, I mean, that's, there are a couple big questions out there. There are a lot, you know, how does meditation promote awe or mindfulness? We don't know. You know, awe was just studied scientifically. We know a lot about gratitude. How does practicing gratitude make us more awe filled? We don't know. And I bet it will. We differentiate the true by gratitude <clears throat> is the feeling of reverence for things that are given to you there you know life gives us things our parents give us things a friend and they tend those gifts tend to be 
better understood, not so mysterious as awe, and smaller, you know, they're, they're on a smaller scale. If somebody gives you, you know, I do a lot of work with Kaiser Permanente, and patients will feel gratitude and awe for their doctor's gifts of life. And that's vast. And the minute that happens, they're like, this is, um, this moves beyond gratitude to the realm of awe. And I think it's one of the most important questions to study is it's easy to cultivate gratitude. Awe has benefits. How do they work together? Thank you. And thanks for your kind words. They mean a lot. Well, I thank you very much, Dr. Keltner. Um, that, that was an amazing presentation. And um, if we can all just sort of show Dr. Keltner our appreciation, please use your reactions to give him a round of applause. And again, thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's Bragg meeting. Uh, we're putting the link to a short survey in our chat. Please take a minute to provide feedback on today's meeting and make recommendations on future topics. We will also send the survey out um, on an email. Our next Bragg meeting will be on January 2024. More details to come soon, and we hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.